Welcome to Faith, Fantasy, and Fairy Tales, a conversation between two Christian nerds about D&D, sci-fi, and any other nerdy stuff we can think of. I'm Seth. I'm Monty. Let's get nerdy together. Monty, what is today's episode theme? Today's topic is... It's about a creature, so we're, we're kind of on this cycle that we're just about to start here, um, where we're going to do a location, we're going to do a monster... And uh, this monster class, it, you will find it on the cover of the monster manual. It is the uh, inc- very famous Beholder. Beholders, that's right. Episode episode two. Episode. Episode. Uh, sued. <laughs> if anybody out there is a is a fan of Critical Role, sued is the like like the cocaine of Alexandria. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully we uh, will not be episode by yeah, yeah. Uh, We're not gonna get <laughs> Wizards sued, of the Coast <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for having this episode. That's right. So episode two, we're talking about beholders tonight. Why did we choose this topic? Well, this topic is probably one of the most d and ist topics in D&D, plain and simple. Um, That's a good way to put it. That well, it's it's the truth because the uh, beholder is original to D and D. No other like you you find. Well, I don't want to say no other. I don't want to get too get too crazy here. But you think about like dragons and uh, griffins mm. and trolls, even orcs and sort of all the those generic, other generic common elves, monstrosities right. of you know lore Minotaurs. throughout history. Minotaurs, exactly. Yeah. You 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 actually see those in other uh, in other media. Uh, we we've talked about it um, in the past, where you see like dragons are not original to fantasy writing, right? They're right. they're actually kind of, they're kind of original to the Bible and God's storytelling, right? right? Uh, so so dragons that's like not original to D and D. Orcs they're not original to D and D. They're they came out well before. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Maybe some of you guys remember. Well, uh, and if you listened to our episode zero, uh, orcs are original to not original, but they they were in uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's writings and stuff like that. So I don't want to get too fast or furious here yet. <laughs> but that's that's why we chose Beholders specifically. Is this is a D and D monster? It's yep. so it's a really cool monster. Uh, the first one, uh, Monty. Do you know? who it was, the the idea behind the Beholder? Well, I know the name, and that would be Rob Kuntz. And uh, I I know that it was first introduced in uh, Greyhawk, which is a supplement of the uh, original D&D released by Guy Gax and TSR. Um, Outside of that, uh, there's really not much more to say. I mean, it just basically started as an interesting boss, and sort of it, it... gained more of its development and sort of its back lore throughout the years that D&D has been around. Yeah. And if you see that, like the evolution of the beholder from, and we'll get into that later, but like from one first edition to fifth edition, there's a huge difference yeah. for sure. Um, they're pretty funny in the first edition, and then they get progressively scarier and more disgusting. Like, right? I think I think <laughs> that they. I, this is my opinion, probably what happened, but most likely, you know, because it was uh, a unique creature created for D and D, it wasn't necessarily in its first iteration given as much, you attention. know, attention. That's a good way to put it, I guess. But yeah. if you've seen the pictures of the original D and D handbooks and everything the pictures look silly it's just sort of this yeah. goofy looking <laughs> character but granted even the adventurers looked pretty silly in those pictures too because they look sure. very like fairy folk kind of <laughs> <laughs> but it, as time progressed it definitely got a lot more serious and they gave it the attention most in my opinion likely because they they see this being an original ip uh that yep. it, it should be generated and sort of you know, made into this central part of D and D, and that's I th- I think you find it on all of these different books and covers, like I mentioned earlier with the Monster Manual. Well, and and I don't know anything to do with D and D that you don't like at least get a reference to the Beholder. You know, Beholders 
what's what's interesting to me, like when it came out, first in, introduced 1975 on in in the Greyhawk supplement. I don't. I don't think that Kuntz actually had an idea that this was going to become a really popular monster, mm-hmm. um, because it, it ended up like kind of giving it its own, getting its own little following, you might say, right? Um, in pop culture and different things too, because like there, like Final Fantasy, which is one of my absolute favorite games of all time, from Final Fantasy one all the way through 16's coming out soon. Uh, beholders are in that. Except they uh, they kind of ripped it off. Mm-hmm. Like it's you know you know it's a beholder because it's one giant eye with all the, all the tentacle, the tentacle eyes, eyes around it and yeah. a big mouth. Thing they they rip it off and they call it the evil eye. You know, yeah, right? But but they do it. Heroes of Might and Magic. Some of you guys out there might know about Heroes of Might and Magic. Um, they also did the same thing mm-hmm. um, in in uh, I think their fourth game or their fifth game. Those are a couple of like the cool. Uh, things that they ripped it directly out of D and D and then just wrote it for themselves, you know. This um, uh, this next bullet here in our in our outline this about Futurama. So this is like my favorite thing. <laughs> so I'm a I'm a big Futurama fan. Um, Seth knows that about me. And yeah. there's there's an episode where uh, Hermes Conrad, the bureaucrat, he sort of like loses his. His passion he for his bureauc- bureaucracy, right? Well, he gets kicked out because he. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, what happens is Bender gets beat up in yep. Hermes' office, <laughs> and it destroys his office. And Hermes just happens to be about to be audited that day by the yep. level thirty-six bureaucrat, and he was level thirty-four. <laughs> anyway, uh, and uh, she comes in, and uh, she sort of takes over as the bureaucrat, and kind of makes the office better, and then ends up. Well, they all want Hermes back. Hermes was, yep. quote unquote, on vacation, but he was actually at a slave camp this whole time. <laughs> but they go to the central bureaucracy. And I realize this is a bit of a long winded thing, but this is the whole episode in a nutshell. Yeah. Um, they go to the central yeah. bureaucracy to demand Hermes back. And while they're there, the rooms that they're going through, they're sort of going through like these, like, you know, different passageways and stuff. And uh, one of the rooms is like an old castle. <laughs> and it's actually I looked this up uh, a while ago it's actually a reference to the original D&D movie the yep. really terrible ones yeah the one everybody <laughs> where there's <laughs> where there's a sleeping beholder yep and they like throw a rock and the beholder's like huh what and it like flies off to go find the rock but it's like working for the bad guys <laughs> anybody who knows anything about beholders and we'll talk more about that um, knows that that's a stupid thing well in the central <laughs> bureaucracy, there's a beholder sleeping, and uh, they're like walking past it, and somebody trips over a rock, and it creates a sound, and the beholder wakes up, and its eyeballs sort of like make like a disco thing. It starts shooting lasers all over the place, and then <laughs> yeah. as they uh, it, they like walk by it, just like nonchalantly, and he's like flies up to them, he goes. Guys, please don't tell my boss I was sleeping. <laughs> and you see, he's got he's got a bureaucrat number yeah, tag yeah. on his shoulder. It's yeah. pretty funny. Yeah. Oh man, and and that's and he actually shows up in two separate episodes. I think same in, one, in, same beholder. Yeah. Same beholder. Yep. He's in that episode, and then the next season he's in another episode. Yep. Um, the same thing. He's he's a he's a bureaucrat, which right. is really funny. Which actually kind of does uh, actually make sense a little bit for that. If you sense. wanted to yeah. find him in the yeah. Futurama lore, that's where he'd be. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, beholders kind of kind of have this uh, interesting following, and again, the reason is they're core D and D for sure. They're they are the D and Dist subject to ever D and D, the way I like to put it. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just gonna go ahead and uh, give you a little bit of background into the monster itself. Something something interesting to pull out would probably be like their challenge rating. Yeah. Um, so. This is a challenge rating 13 creature. Now, any good DM knows that uh, challenge rating tends to be a hard measurement um, to actually go by because if you if you attempt to use the challenge rating system, you can sometimes TPK your party, especially in yeah. the case of a beholder, <laughs> if you play them correctly. They have an intelligence of 17, uh, so they're they're known as being extremely intelligent but 17 obviously doesn't sound very high i tend to give them a higher uh, stat block for that artificially just because 
I think they deserve a higher stat block for that. But I think that the reason that it naturally gives them that, that 17 is because if you had uh, a higher intelligence, all of the magic that they cast gets higher modifiers to them, therefore doing more damage or having uh, harder to escape death rays when it comes to their eye stocks. So, um, but yeah, that's, those are some general stats. Is there any, any more you want to reference, Seth? Well, just the fact that, like, you know, beholders in their kind of their uh, their design and makeup and everything, it makes sense that they're like of above average intelligence. It also makes sense if we we'll, we'll get into their personalities a little bit too. Um, it actually kind of makes sense that they're not like exceptionally intelligent hmm. because they're a little vain, right? You know, and they also have a little bit of uh, like I said, we'll we'll get into this a little bit more in their personality, but they're they're a little xenophobic. They're not afraid technically, but they don't really like other species. Right. So, you know, they, they kind of tend to stay by themselves, which makes it, it kind of makes sense. And it lends a little bit to that uh, uh, 17 on their intelligence. Uh, as far as like their abilities, though, or their their appearance, excuse me, their appearance. We kind of referenced it a little bit for first edition. The first edition appearance of a beholder um, was as if uh, Rob Kuntz was like, OK, here's a circle. <laughs> um here's an eye mm -hmm. uh here's a mouth uh that's kind of boring okay uh here's a bunch more eyes you know <laughs> and that's all you got well like, what's that, funny i think too is it looked like he was started to draw like a medusa and yeah. then he like he was gonna draw like a medusa cyclops but he sucked right. at it because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the eye stocks are really short yeah but that's it, definitely, it definitely first edition has that beholder alien feel though. I mean it's still it's still Does it's okay. really silly looking yeah. but it still has that kind of alien feel that um uh those of you that know anything about beholders that they they tend to have. Right. So I I would encourage you if you have never actually seen his original drawing of a beholder get onto YouTube or get onto Google or whatever you use to uh type it in find it cuz it is pretty hilarious and yeah. I don't know, maybe reference it in your games. I don't right. know. It'd be kind of well the, to go uh, more into the appearances. Um, this is sort of an interesting aspect about beholders, but they're every one of the, they don't have like races or sub races, right? Right. Each beholder is unique, and yeah. uh, it it really comes from um, sort of their reproduction process. Uh, because uh, you're going to talk about the reproduction process. <laughs> yes. Well, it's probably. Which is awesome. Yeah, yeah. It, I, this kind of goes into their abilities a little bit, yeah. and I'll just go ahead and touch on those now. But the reproduction of a beholder takes place during the dreaming of another beholder. Um, beholders have a unique ability to be able to create uh, and uh, manipulate matter or magic, and because it can do both of those things, from what I've found, and I was I searched pretty diligently for this, up to a mile radius. That is how far, so this is sort of some suppositions that I've had to make, but a beholder can spawn through the dreams of another beholder if it imagines itself uh, as being dirty, right, in its dream. A gross, dirty beholder might spawn mm -hmm. up to a mile away. And so yeah. its sphere of influence is one mile of being able to manipulate any matter and magic in that sphere. And we're going it, to talk about that a little bit, too, it, later. They yeah. they do this unconsciously, though. They can only do yep. this through their dreams, and that's how beholders are spawned. Um, and yeah. it usually, like I said, has something to do with them just dreaming about some topic, and that topic, therefore, being formed into reality. And if it has anything to do with the beholder itself, which them being so that sort of those int intelligent, self-centered creatures, right. they, they do that, and it, it would be create another beholders anyway so like i said well, they're all very unique in how they are they are very unique but they all have kind of the same um basic appearance sure one might say it's their spherical uh floating orb with a giant central eye um usually a gaping mouth with like sharp teeth and stuff like that mm -hmm. and then these eye stalks it depends on the beholder themselves but typically 10 Different eye stalks. Yeah, right. I think comes between out at four and angles. ten. Is... Yep. Sometimes, it, sometimes they're, they're actually up sometimes on top none. Of the head. So that's actually right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So sometimes they're up on top of the head. Sometimes they're all around the the orb. Mm -hmm. um, but they all have eyes on the end of each one of these eye stalks or these tentacles, 
Anyways, that's that's for like a, a real true beholder. Sure. There are like beholder kin. There's things that that are relatives akin you could say. to beholders yeah. that are related to beholders, the cousins maybe you might say um, that aren't actually true beholders, but right. they also have you know they they actually did spawn from beholders. You know, same mm-hmm. same concept. It was like a nightmare brought this one to to life or you know whatever. Right. Um, but that, that kind of moves into their abilities. The fact that they're a floating orb, a lot of people are like, okay, they can fly. Well, the flying speed of like everything else out there is usually 30 to 50 feet mm, uh, 60. Uh, per turn. Yeah. 60 feet. The, <laughs> the, the hover uh, speed of a beholder is 20 feet. That is as fast as they go. Right. And actually, <laughs> this, is, this is something I'd like to touch on because officially, according to Wizards of the Coast, Beholders do not fly using magic. It is a biological thing going on in their body. They create a gas that's lighter than air, and that is how they fly. And then when they exude the gas out of a different direction, that's how they propel themselves. And so if they... Kind of for like, example, kind of like, turned off. Kind of like coughing from, uh, or coughing or wheezing mm, from Pokemon. Pokemon. Yeah. And that's actually kind of where they came from. <laughs> right. But what I'm saying is, ultimately, beholders can use that to their advantage if they wanted to shut magic off entirely in an area. They can still yep. fly naturally yep. um, using you know physical laws instead of magical ones. So You touched on their ability to, to shut magic off. So one of the things that they can do is they have that great central eye, and mm-hmm. each one of their each one of their eyes actually represents a different ability that they have. Usually, um, I don't like sa- I don't like saying that, that it's magic because they're not really magical rays that they that they shoot out, um, but they do have the ability like on their their central eye. Mm-hmm. It is a anti magic thing. Like they could shoot out with their central eye this cone, um, and anywhere they're looking. Uh, and I believe what 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 is it? Uh, it's a hundred and fifty foot cone. So it's a huge cone. Yeah. Anything that they're looking at in their field of view, whatever's in front of them, no more, no magic works. Right. And that means no magic items. That means no spells work. That means if you have like a magic ability that is like a racial, mm-hmm. even those don't work. Right. Um, and that's what's really interesting about the about I, the beholders. They they all have these these uh, abilities to cancel out magic right and then their their eye stalks all do a bunch of different things depending on the beholder a regular beholder it's got usually the same 10 yeah yep and uh well i think i need to correct you real quick because and this is to go back officially according to the wizards of the coast they have something inside of their eyes um at the back of their eyes called a let me just read this real quick it's a weird word evocularies oh these are magical organs they're like nerve cells in the back of the human eye that's what they're akin to Um, but these evocularies what they do is they actually build up magical energy inside the eyeball Uh, and uh, according to wizards of the coast again the retinas of these eyeballs are actually magic focus focus crystals yeah 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 i didn't know that um, until I went out to find this, because I, like you, thought that this was sort of kind of like how dragons can naturally make fire. Breathe fire, right? right. Or it's lightning n- or whatever right. it might it's be. It's not a magical attack when dragons do that, right? right? So if you have an anti-magic shield or whatever, doesn't work against dragon flames or dragon lightning, because or their breath attacks at least, right? If they're casting right. a spell, dragons can do that. The same thing that I thought with beholders. Well, it, it turns out to be the opposite. It turns out that beholders are magic casters. They they use their their eyes more like a focus, so sort of like focus orbs, right? And I think a beholder eye would be an incredibly awesome focus orb to have if you were a wizard. <laughs> but that's like that's what they're to like. Have that on a staff. We mm. were gonna t- we we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. I, I wanted to wanted to touch on that, but like, yeah. what could you? do with a with beholder parts yes and there's <laughs> there, crafting, now that i know up. more about their biology i think there's actually a lot of really cool stuff you can pull out of them if so you I can didn't, defeat I them didn't actually <laughs> i didn't actually uh i didn't know that uh, thank you for correcting me i would yeah. have to say that you know with all the stuff that i've i've read and i've i've uh enjoyed playing D and stuff like that I, I think there's a lot of people out there that don't know that right i think there's a lot of people out there that thought 
um, like I did, that the eye stalks and their and their eye rays that they shot from them were kind of a, a racial thing that that uh, was not magical. Right. So th- thank you for correcting yeah, yeah. me on that. Another ability. Uh, so you talked about the uh, non magical field, the cone. Um, yep. I'll I'll just touch on a couple of the eye stock abilities, and maybe you can go into like the sub categories of beholders and some of their abilities. Sure. But beholders generally have dominate, right? Whether it's creature yeah. or person, as one of their powers on their eye stocks, they generally have uh, sleep. They generally have disintegrate, which you know that's like usually the one that the players don't want to get hit by. <laughs> um, and they have charm. I think more on beholders leaning towards sort of the effect spells, where you're, yeah, you're a causing, control spell. yeah, c- control spells. They have telekinesis. Yeah. That's actually how right. they manipulate the world around them because they don't have hands. They just use their telekinesis right. eye. Uh, I think that a good team, a good party, would go after those uh, the telekinesis and uh, disintegrate eye stocks first. Whoa, 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 whoa! Don't get but, ahead of yourself. We're gonna talk. We're gonna talk tactics in a little while. Sure. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what else? What other things might they have? Like, for example, well, on a flame beholder. Uh, well, I was I was gonna bring up uh, the if you if you do have out there a uh, monster manual, um, you're gonna see that there are there is specifically one beholder subrace, and then there is a beholder uh, kin. Both of those in the original 5e monster manual. Mm-hmm. Um, the two that come to mind is number one, the Death Tyrant, and the other one is the Spectator. Yes. The Death Tyrant is actually an undead beholder. Um, it's not a zombie. Nope. It is not a zombie. And if you look at the picture, I actually really like the picture they're very cool. of the Death Tyrant because they're super cool. Yeah. They're, they're literally a floating skull with um, like motes of light. For their eyes that mm-hmm. aren't connected to their body, right? Not, to their to their skull, because um, there's no though, flesh on the beak. There's no flesh right. in the creature anymore. Even their central eye is no longer like it's not rotting or anything like that. It's legitimately a center uh, moat of light. Mm-hmm. Um, they have their uh, rays, their their eye rays, and their ma- their magic more focuses on like necromantic power, right? Um, and like darkness and stuff like that. Their their main eye. Um, I'll I'll just read this from the monster manual. manual is instead of an anti magic cone, it's a negative energy cone. Right. It's like a um. It well, it's it's not that it causes damage. It's like as people are losing damage, if they hit uh, zero hit points, that person becomes a zombie and is in control of the death tyrant. Oh, interesting. So it's almost like. A lich, you know, has the ability to raise dead. Right. Theirs is theirs is automatic, and uh, we didn't mention this before on their on their main eye ray with their anti magic cone. Mm-hmm. They literally can just flip it on and off. However well, they, they could want. they could close that eye. Yeah. Right. Well, they can close that they can close <clears throat> that eye, but they can literally just flip on and off the uh, the ability the ability. Right. So that's that that's is something pretty cool. And that's important for the DMs out there who want their player. You know, let's say the players. Decide. I'm going to jump inside the non-magic beam, right? Yeah. To save myself from one of the eye stalks. Well, that's probably not going to help you. He doesn't have to shoot a non-magic ray. Nope. <laughs> Whether it's him closing his eye or him deciding that, uh, you know, depending on how you want to play the beholder, obviously. But um, yeah. yeah, that's not necessarily the best strategy. Uh, I, I know that that <laughs> some, could be some a good DMs strategy, some DMs but... kind of get this a, a little screwed because they yeah. they know that it's magical if if they're thinking about the eye stalks uh, lasers right but they also sort of disregard the fact that this uh, inherent trait of the beholder is something that they are in control of right right so. So, the uh, Death Tyrant, a, that's something I wanted to talk about when it comes to yeah. the reproduction portion. Death Tyrants are actually created during a dreaming sequence of a regular yep. Beholder. Yep. Uh, a Beholder must dream about a couple of different things, but they must dream about essentially being immortal. Yep. And the only way to be immortal is to, to become a Lich, and that's the limitation of the material plane. Um, 
liches discover this, like the Thans, but um, <laughs> beholders sort of accidentally discover this <laughs> when they're sleeping. Yeah, yeah. Um, a couple of them out there that that I thought were kind of interesting that might be homebrew, I don't really know. Um, but some of them that, that uh, I found that I thought were kind of interesting, one specifically – um, the Doom Sphere mm. is a it is a sub race of Beholder, yep. just like the Death Tyrant. But instead of uh, being created or you know uh, being the spawn of another Beholder, right. it's actually a Beholder that dies and then it rises as a ghost. Those of you that have played D and D out there a few times, I'm sure you've used ghosts or whites or you banshees, know, banshees yeah. or some of the other some of the other like ghostly figures that are out there. Well, doom spheres are basically just a ghost beholder, right? And their their eye rays are a lot like the death tyrants. They've got a couple of different ones, but they're they're wispy and they can you know move through walls and and uh, they've got a little bit of that uh, um, fear aspect like kind of mm-hmm. like a like a dragon does you know they've got that that dragon draconic presence mm-hmm. yeah doom spheres are a lot like that uh, a couple of them that that you can actually find in either the monster manual or volos uh volos uh what, what's a guide to what is it oh gosh volos guide. you're you're breaking my mind now you're i know it's me... volos guide and i'm an idiot for <laughs> sorry guys out there i don't have my volos next to me right now um, but Volos, you can find them. Uh, uh, Mordenkainen's Tomb of Foes. Mm. There are some other things out there. Um, but the Death Kiss and the Spectator are um, not actually Beholders. They are a Beholder kin. They're they're related to Beholders. The Death Kiss is actually it it, it came to to being because of a nightmare that it, that a Beholder had. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And it usually about like, getting cut or uh, losing right, some blood about about bleeding. Yep. Right. Exactly. Um, it's this orb. Right. Mm-hmm. It's got a main eye. No mouth. Doesn't have a but mouth. But it's got all of these. It's got all of these tentacles. And on the end, instead of eye stalks, these are tentacles with little mouths on them, which and it can drink, talk with, which which it can talk with. Yeah, it's got <laughs> it's kind of creepy mouths. Uh, they can actually drain blood with those. Yeah. Um, spectators are another beholder kin, and they're created. This is another um, kind of like the Doom Sphere. They're not actually created by a by a nightmare or right. a dream of a beholder. These are actually created um, through a ritual. Right. That somebody does, like a wizard, or you know, usually, um, if you look in your if you look in your monster manual, it's kind of interesting because they're not out of all of the other beholders and beholder kin they're le- they're lawful evil or they're chaotic evil mm-hmm. the spectator is lawful neutral can be lawful good also which is really interesting and and actually we're going to we're going to get into some alignment stuff too later um, mm-hmm. when we talk about some notable beholders but mm-hmm. yeah they're they are traditionally lawful neutral right. which is interesting um, because of their like aberration and their disgusting features and everything, but they are actually created through a ritual, and they have to serve the master of that ritual. Now they do, unlike golems, for instance. We may get into golems another time, but they they actually have their own mental faculties. They right. can, they can reason, they can think. Um, they they're just bound to the creator that that created them yeah sometimes it's also possible to reason with them um if if you're you know posing a threat to whatever they're guarding now it's sort of in the nature of these of the spectator to just guard it you know loyally but if they feel like you know they have a willpower of their own right and they feel like if their contract uh that they had uh underwent was not uh, in word and technical specificity not breached by you taking said treasure, you could convince them. Let's say that, you know, they said, well, make sure that this treasure is protected. Well, the beholder could decide, okay, well, it's probably protected with you. And I'll just go along <laughs> with you, right? Yeah, it it, it yeah. can be reasoned with that way. And they're, yeah. they're still pretty intelligent. Not um, beholder, though. Remember, it's a boulder kin. Right. It's, it's spectator. Right, they have the four eye stalks. They look a little bit more like I think where they have like dragon-like skin usually. Um, right, they're kind of exactly. scaly. 
Uh, yep. They have horns a little bit, you know, and their their facial yeah. features look a little bit different, and they're smaller than beholders are. That's another much thing. much smaller. And yeah. again, four eye stocks, so obviously, definitely a little bit different. Um, right. I when I went on to kind of look up variations and variants and what whatnot that I, you know, I just wanted I like something to share with you guys out there. I found a lot out there. Some some that is that is actually written. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, by by Wizards of the Coast, others that is that are published by other um, third party publishers that, that are you know just adding different kinds of variations or whatnot, mm-hmm. and then just all of these different homebrews out there. And I would encourage you, really seriously, uh, if you read your monster manual, it actually does encourage you as well to vary the way your beholder is. Yes. If you're gonna play a beholder, if you're gonna at, bring a beholder into your game. I would say use it to and and make it your own because mm-hmm. there are a lot. It's a lot more fun when you take a monster, um, especially if it's going to be a big bad guy, mm-hmm. um, the big bad evil guy. You know, especially if he's going to be your BBEG for this adventure part, you definitely want to make him your own personality wise or whatever it might be. Right. Um, well, here's here's here's, here's a way you can do this. Beholders are based around sort of their their main properties, right? Um, so their appearance is going to be impacted by what you give them to do, but what they do is cast spells, ultimately. Right. And so vary the type of spells that their 10 eye stocks can have, right? And that's this is sort of what g- generically you do when you have like a pyro uh, beholder or you have a frost beholder or zombie beholder or any of these things, right? You, what you notice is just the spells tend to change among yep. all of their uh, eye stocks and, and their main eye. Um, and maybe some of their motivations change. Uh, it's rare that you find that their personality changes. And honestly, that's okay because the personality trait of thinking that you are perfect and that you need to make the world like you is sort of how <laughs> they become the BBEG in your games, but change their yeah, spells. We haven't even discussed the personality. Yet. Right. And <laughs> we kind of went over it, but when you change their spells, make that around and sort of come up with the backstory of what type of dream another beholder must have had, right? What possible interaction its child, its offspring beholder, this one that you have created, had upon its existence and now the other beholders' contemplation of the new beholder's existence. Sometimes they fight, yeah. sometimes they go their separate ways. Um, yep. And like I said, change those spells to make sense with what type of a holder you have created. And that's and with the that best said, way to align them up. With that said, if you, if you want, if you're going to build your own beholder, I would, I would tr- strongly encourage you to do that. Cause it's going to be fun. It's going to be more fun for you, the DM, and it's going to be more tra- challenging for your players. Mm-hmm. Um, those of you that are players out there, uh, we'll talk to you guys a little bit too, about maybe tactics and stuff like that for beholders. But, um, one of the things you don't want to do is like take it and make it completely different monster, right? Mm-hmm. So you want to kind of hold to hold to some of the like the foundational tropes. thing, the tropes yeah. of of the beholder, um, and and personality is a major thing for beholders Absolutely. because they they have this. Um, I spoke earlier about the fact that they're xenophobic. Uh, they don't like other people. They don't like other races. They don't, they don't like even other... really like other beholders. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, the, you don't, you don't find them doing really anything with any other uh, intelligent races because not only do they believe that they they are the smartest and most amazing wise creatures on the planet in the universe in the mm-hmm. multiverse, um, they also think that they are like the pinnacle mm-hmm. of bodily perfection that's right they they view themselves their bodies and their just just their absolute being as perfect which is interesting because one of the flaws of a of every beholder is the fact that they don't actually have one mind mm. they have a warring thought process constantly it's almost like having a split personality mm-hmm. constantly and if you read any 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 of those uh, um, any of your DM uh, books out there, Monster Manual, uh, any of those uh, supplements that help you to role play uh, a beholder, they will tell you this. They they have this constant warring in their own minds, mm-hmm. um, and it's as if two entities are controlling the same body. Right. And 
and it makes them super paranoid. Right. Super paranoid. <laughs> it's um, it stifles them from accomplishing their goals. Right. And yes, that's so. Beholders are pretty good at making good on their plans, but they do get stifled by themselves. Yep. They might over plan. Let's say your adventuring party is running around. I'll give you an example from my own life or campaigns. Uh, <laughs> running around Icewind Dale, murdering random people because they're a bunch of murder hobos. And the beholder <laughs> catches wind of this. Because maybe one of the random people that your beholder uh, had taken control of gets murdered by your <laughs> band of adventuring murder hobos. Um the beholder is going to immediately think this adventuring party is thinking about me. They know that I exist. Not only do they know I exist, they're planning to destroy me. And that beholder will waste hours and days and months of its time planning to receive you, your party, into its lair and all of the possible traps that it will set for you. So to make sure that you, any plan that you could come up with is dealt with. And it doesn't just happen for just your adventuring party. The beholder thinks this about anybody, right? Yeah. And it, it <laughs> stifles itself because it wants, it has ambitions, right? The beholder may not be cooperative, but they will control a group, a clan, a situation in order to dominate whatever objective that they're going after. Well, right. when they're doing that, they end up, wasting more time planning against things that'll never happen because of their paranoia. And that comes out which, of that split mind. Which like is typically why they stay pretty much in their lair. In their lair, yeah. Uh, you don't really find beholders kind of roaming the countryside uh, looking for, you know, trying to accomplish something. They're typically stuck in their lair. Uh, you know, dragons do that too. To a certain extent, especially mm -hmm. when they get older and older and older. Right. But beholders are really known for it. They are, um, because of their paranoia, because there's their xenophobia, they're they're kind of like the hermit of the BBEG, right? right. They, they want to hide away, but th they also have all of these machinations. And we're going to we're going to touch on this just a little bit later, that they want to be able to have power and they want to have things. And, you know, each one of them has their own ambitions, mm -hmm. but they they usually do it through extension through minions for the right. most part yeah um you know they're what's layered. great about a hole in the ground seth what's that if the hole has one point of entry you can't get snuck up on that's true and beholders <laughs> love to not be snuck up on that's true and in their lair they they <laughs> They, that's true. And the truth is about their lair, it's like usually this giant cavern mm -hmm. with one en entrance, one exit, you know, or they don't typically have ways that people can sneak up on them. Yeah. They know what's going on, you know. Right. And the holders are really, really, really right. interesting for me because, like, can you imagine having that thought process? Just, just to just to put a pause on our on our outline for just a second. Yeah. Have the thought process of a beholder, like their personality, the fact that they're always afraid, but they want to control everything. Right. I think this is kind of an kind of an interesting, <laughs> like, you you really if if you're a good DM, you want to try to think like that, right? Mm -hmm. And how you're going to use that that type of thinking to ultimately tell a good story. Right. And that's, I mean, that's what we're all here for, right? What is their, what are their layers like, Monty? Well, they're alien creatures, right? They're not actually from uh, Toril, which is the planet, I guess you could say, that uh, right. all the adventures take place on. Um, it's more like a flat world, <laughs> <laughs> good news the earth is flat um for yeah. those of you out there that know the truth <laughs> so toril is the material plane um out into the stars in outer space beyond uh the actual visual uh celestial bodies is a place called the far realms that is where beholders are from they yep. come from the i think it's called the the beholder mind or the the 
great mind, something along those lines. It's it's similar. The mother uh, is it? Isn't it the mother mind? Something like that. Gosh, it's yeah. It, it's ringing the bells, but I'm I don't have it yeah. in front of me. Um, so that's where they come from. Somehow made it to Faerun, and because they float, so they don't really have to have necessarily human like things. You they don't need walkways and stairs. Right. You know, and their tunnels can be winding and kind of upside down. Um, the way that they store objects might be really high up and sort of all around this entire cave. They really don't need a floor. They fly everywhere that they go, unless they intend right. on entertaining, which no beholder does. They Sometimes they have pets. <laughs> yeah. You would also find that it's probably slimy or organic along the walls, yeah. um, depending on if they dream of their home world or not, um, their dream can impact their lair, right? Maybe a beholder sleeps and dreams that their lair is a tropical island. Suddenly, their entire lair might look like, you know, there's just a, a glowing kind of a orb twist. in the sky. And you see what I'm saying? Yeah, but kind of like a twisted version of that. Sure, it's, yeah. Obviously, like through the, a beholder's perspective, never it's yeah, going to be it, right, actually exactly. pleasant to look at. Yeah, you wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want to go to this beach because you'd be swimming in the slime and laying on the slimy sand, mm, and yeah. the the sun or the orb that gives off light is dripping slime. Right. <laughs> usually, they're slimy places. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, but again, that comes up because they're aliens, right? Right, they're they're very alien uh, uh, nature for sure. What what I think is actually kind of neat about the beholders is is the way they interact with their lair. Like if like in combat, for mm, instance, yeah, is they have layer actions. Like, That's what yeah, called. one of their layer actions that that by far is one of my favorites is because everything's like kind of organic in their lair, mm-hmm. uh, just just because of their very presence. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot like dragons in that way, actually. Um, they can – one of their layer actions is an eye can open up on any flat surface. Right. And then they can use that eye that just opened up on any flat surface mm-hmm. as one of their eye ray attacks. Right. And they can shoot any eye ray that they have that that particular beholder uses from that eye. So sure. you think – like let's say this is a hundred and fifty foot cavern across, and they're in the middle, and all of the uh, party members are on like one corner, and they're behind a rock. Mm-hmm. Well, an eye could pop open behind the, those party members right. and shoot a disintegrate ray at one of the party members. Absolutely, so, yeah, and and it's something to like sort of break up usually the emptiness of a layer uh, that I think is a good idea is make the way that they dream about their layer interesting so that you can add some interesting topography, right? Right. Um, So, like, maybe they dream that it's a a temple. They dream about their layer being, like, a a worshipping place for them, and obelisks and pillars come up out of the ground. Then you can actually add a little bit of different, you know, you know, things to the play space. Maybe they dream that they're living in a volcano or, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that could impact that, but it can certainly change uh, sort of the playscape if you're looking to make that more interesting. And I think you should as a DM. I could only imagine like uh, you're, you're talking about like a temple for, for, a, for a beholder, right? right? <clears throat> and all of these pillars, they're, they're, they're just know, eye stalks. They look- <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they just break off and they're like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. They're they they also have kind of an impact on surrounding uh, regions, and you kind of spoke to this mm-hmm. earlier about the fact that their their ability to re- reproduce through dreams mm-hmm. it's not usually intentional. No, not intentional at all. Um, because again, they don't really want competition, right? <laughs> and other beholders are just more competition just for a threat. them. Yep. But one of the things that like that that mile radius around a beholder layer, beholders in general, mm-hmm. um, they'll they'll start having impact on the on the creatures and the and the uh, landscape and things like that um, to the point where even like the buildings, let's say let's say they're under the uh, their layer is actually under a a city, mm-hmm. right? And w- we talked about Baldur's Gate last week, yeah, right. 
And they're, let's say that they have a layer that is under the city in Baldur's Gate. The bridge portion of, the, of Baldur's Gate, what was, the, what was the name of it? Uh, the Worms Crossing. Worms Crossing. So suddenly Worms Crossing is like, has this really gross m- accumulation of slime right. on, on the bridge at all times, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, and and that could be an indication that there's well there might be a beholder layer around here right. somewhere. Um, another thing is people and and even just just all the creatures around that in that area start getting like paranoid. They start developing par- paranoia to the right. point where they think there's some somebody's constantly watching them. Um, they're always looking over their shoulder. They kind of get that same personality almost as a beholder. Mm-hmm. It's as if they're. It's as if the personality is bleeding off onto the other creatures. You could imagine what that would be like in a city. Right. Like suddenly there's slime everywhere and people are paranoid all the time. Right. (laughs) Not that that you're speaking. You're in in my city. (laughs) Yeah, it's like it's like Chicago. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think we know what's wrong with that city now. Yeah, there's a beholder there. That makes sense. Just like it's it's in DC. That's that totally makes sense. Well, it's a good thing I'm a gun wizard. <laughs> um, well, let's move on a little bit. Let's uh, let's just talk about role playing ideas, and I think we kind of sure. touched on some of that um, tactics to use as a player. I, I'd love to discuss that with you guys out there. We're mm. kind of running short on time right now, but um, send us some ideas so we can. Interact with them. Sure. Uh, send out your send out your questions or your ideas as far as uh, what you think is a good idea to, to use in a tactic against a beholder, um, and even vary it. You know, have you ever fought a death tyrant? Mm-hmm. Tell us how you did it. Right. You know, we'd like we'd like to hear it. Just so you um, know, there is only one perfect way to fight a death tyrant, and I know <laughs> what it is. So if you write in the comments something other than what I know. I will immediately just delete your comment because I know it's wrong and you will be expelled will imme- from ever listening <laughs> yeah. to yeah. this podcast ever again. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes, we are booting you from the show. That's right. <laughs> We're not going to have you on as a guest. Deal with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are going to ho- go ahead. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna bring you on and then boot you immediately. <laughs> yeah. Five minutes in, you'll be invited <laughs> to the show to be removed yeah. from the show. Force. I would like to talk to. I would like to talk a little bit just about like some of the notable beholders that are out there. The major one that like everybody knows of is Xanathar. Um, the Xanathar. The Xanathar. That's right. <laughs> well, anybody that has played D anD D for a little bit. Uh, knows of Xanathar's Guide to Everything, mm-hmm. which is kind of presumptive, <laughs> you might say. Bit, bit of that guide. beholder hubris. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a little bit, a little bit hubris. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the Xanathar is actually a a leader of the Thieves Guild, and I can't remember the name of the city, but a lot of people usually put it in Waterdeep. I don't think it. W- it's not typically in Waterdeep. The where the Xanathar is the leader of the Thieves Guild, but this is another. This is one of those instances where a beholder is the their machinations, their ambitions that they have. They're using this Thieves Guild to get what they want. Uh, for them, it's money and stuff like that, and and intrigue. Um, they also uh, the Xanathar is the title of this beholder. Mm-hmm. Um, his he's he actually gets replaced almost pretty regularly by his own dream. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then the, and then the new beholder becomes the Xanathar. Yeah. But each one of them has the same pet fish. The Xanathar is like obsessed with this pet goldfish. It's a goldfish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's just a goldfish. On the it's front like, page of Xanathar's guide to everything is yeah, this goldfish yeah, exactly. in a bowl. It's, just a goldfish in a bowl, <laughs> and they are a- absolutely obsessed with it. It's like the, it's a pet, but it's like they always talk to it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's it's a really it's a it's pretty funny. Um, another one was uh, Manzam, and this one, if you look at like the if you if you guys interested in looking at like third fourth uh, edition D and D, look at the beholders from that. And Manzam actually looks a lot like those beholders, kind of a little bit even more uh, terrifying, if, mm. if you might say, than the than the fifth edition. 
Um, he's a member of the Zentarum, which is a uh, a spy network. The yeah. Black Network is what it's called. And then one of my this is this was one that fascinated me. His name is Tobulux or Tobulux, mm-hmm. and he was an outcast. He was a beholder, and then he was outcast as a beholder because he's actually a good guy. <laughs> he's not evil, and he's not xenophobic, and he's not paranoid. You know, he's he's legitimately like this. Seems this like a regular beholder. guy. <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a regular guy. Yeah, and he's a ranger, which is even more weird. Yes, like, that is the, probably what, the weirdest part of it. I don't is, know how he uses he, a bow and arrow, but <laughs> I was just gonna say, what does he do? Does he use telekinesis to shoot his bow and right. arrow? You know. Does he shoot arrows out of his eye stalks? Is it possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's his, that's his eye ray. Isn't yeah. it? He shoots arrows out of them. Arrow laser beams. Anyway. And and he actually has a friend. This is is just as bizarre. Mm-hmm. He's got a friend who's an illithid, a mind flayer. Yep. Who has also been thrown out of the mind flayer uh, illithid camp, mm-hmm. you might say, colony for being a good guy. Right. For being good aligned, which is, it's just, like I said, it fascinated me. I thought it was hilarious. I can only imagine what, what these guys are, you know, they're walking around and like, ah, freak, you know, and they start getting rocks thrown at them and magic cast at them. And they're just like, hey, we're just Or they, to- you know, in the distant <laughs> future, join the central bureaucracy because they're immortal. Or, yeah, right? that, <laughs> that's who it is. That, that makes sense. It's yeah. Tobulux. <laughs> Yeah, that old he, son he, of does, a gun. he wants to be a good guy, you know. <laughs> right. Just don't tell my boss I was sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that note, I do want to close because uh, we are we have run out of time for tonight. But I would like to say thank you guys for listening. Uh, Monty, go ahead and give them our call to action. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave those comments that I am going to absolutely read all of those things that you say, then (laughs) tell you how wrong you are. So those are important. You know, it's a step-by-step process. But if you don't leave a comment, I can't correct you. So please do that. And I don't know how we're going to – yeah, I don't know how it's going to work if you don't leave a comment so we can bring you on the show and immediately boot you. (laughs) (laughs) It's very important. So just do that. Very important. That's also, right. you can leave us some comments that give us a little bit of pointers. This is something that is for you, and if you like to listen to these things, we want to make it better for you. So that's that's one serious that's right. thing I'll say. <laughs> I'm, I, yeah, and I, I would like to add just to that uh, feedback. You know, it, it doesn't have to be feedback just for the content. Mm-hmm. You know, give us feedback on uh, the production, uh, the sound quality, all of that, because we'd like to know um, where we can improve. Right. This is our beginning journey into the podcasting world, and we really we're enjoying ourselves. Um, but most of all, we want the content to for you guys for you to enjoy it because that's really what this is about. We want you guys to enjoy what our back and forth a little bit. On that note, we love you guys and have a good night. Slay those dragons. They've got all eight original classes, right? Okay. And and they they want to do three. I wonder if the fighter is going to be even worth having. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> they want I've... to do three. They want to do three or five. I can't remember uh, subclasses, and okay. then have like downloadable content later on for other subclasses for like from Xanathars or right. whatever else. You know, Xanathar. Um, how topical. How, how topical. <laughs> yeah, perfect. It's funny. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, and then, like, because that would be so so much fun to play a Hexblade Warlock. I know that I would never be able to actually get Yuvari in the game because they're not going to have Aarakocra, you know. But What? Well, think about it. What? No, I, there's no, no DM, way that... Like, no, no DM likes flying characters. No. Nah, I think that that's silly. I, I mean, other than me and maybe you. I've always had a flying character in my parties every time. Even if it's really? not natural, like they'll they'll spell fly themselves somehow. They'll that's like the first thing that uh, somebody who wants to fly thinks of. Like they're <laughs> they're oh, level yeah. two, and they're like, I you know I'm looking for like a wing suit or something. <laughs> like okay, <laughs> like some artisan or something. I mean, I would love it if they if they came out with an Arakoka race like as a DLC, that would be epic. Yeah, I think it'd be one of the well, coolest. Well, if you think about like Jonathan, right in the D and D movie, because yeah. it's so obviously popular, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't have the Arakoka show. That is up the at only all. reason. 
That's the only reason you get Tabaxi, Aracocra. I mean, Dragonborn's a little bit more right. I mean, they're uh, super realistic because yeah. they're in the because they're in the player's handbook. Right. But yeah, no, I think I, they're going to come through. I really do. I hope so. I think the Lar- Psionic, Larian did a really Tabaxi good job. are going to come through. All that stuff. Yeah. Larian did a really good job with uh, Divinity and Divinity Two. Absolutely. I mean, both of those games are really good and. Divinity Original Sin, when when you and I played it, like it was just fun to play. Yeah, I was like, I looked forward to just getting on and playing that game with you. It's it's sort of once you figure out the trick of just blow up all the barrels, then you kind of it becomes really easy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, all all the time. But it is, the- yeah, just <laughs> just shoot barrels. You'll kill everything. Yeah. You'll never yeah. lose. <laughs> but yeah, no, I think I it's got a great story and. Um, when when I heard that Larian was doing Baldur's Gate, I think you were the one who told me. Yep. I just exploded with hype. And that's, oh yeah. I I I'm a little cynical now, so it's hard for me to get hyped about stuff. Well, all right. C- cynicism happens with age. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, when you want right. to kick this off.